I want to talk to Michelle Caruso Cabrera, who's here this morning with us, a CNBC contributor. Um, it's nice to see you. Good also, to see uh, you. Eduardo Cabrera is here, Longview Global Managing Director and CNBC contributor. What is your take? Since you're sitting here, we're going to go first, ladies first. Uh, what, what do you make of what the Biden administration is saying about the, the cloud piece of this before we even get into what you think Janet Yellen is going to say later in China? Well, it's a natural extension of the chip span already. They've already said that certain chips cannot be sent to China, right? You, chips that are used for advanced right. uh, AI. So if a Chinese company could circumvent that ban by using cloud com com computing services, well, it makes sense to actually continue to make sure be able to thwart their ability to use those chips. So that doesn't surprise me that th this loophole would be closed. What is the next step of this, though? Meaning, is this just, if you think these are connected, is there, is there sort of a, a next permutation? Oh, I, I think there's going to be continuous tit for tat, right? Like we just seen now gallium and germanium being, uh, you know, export controlled by the Chinese. That's them trying to ratchet it up. I'm curious to see once this series of diplomatic visits happens, do we start to see outbound investment controls that we've been hearing about for a very long time, right. but we know that Treasury is more dovish than other parts of the administration about not wanting to control as much uh, U.S. dollars uh, going into China. So, uh, I, you know, it's an extremely difficult right. situation. We're connected, and yet right. the Biden administration is concerned about China's intentions. Dwarbrook, the other piece of this, though, is you're going to have Janet Yellen go there. I imagine she will be, you described it as dovish, but uh, amenable to trying to keep things together, if you will. But at the same time, there are so many in Congress, the Senate, and elsewhere who are screaming from the top of the roofs at this point uh, about the, the problems that they see with China. And so, you know, you're going it, it, to he hear one piece of it this week from, from Yellen, but there's this other piece of it, and how do they square those two things? Yeah, that's, that's the right way to look at it, Andrew. Look, not just Congress and, and other places in Washington, but, right, but in the Biden administration uh, itself, there's a lot of different views that trend towards the hawkish side. And look, I think uh, Yellen is clear that she wants to have a healthy, she calls it, economic relationship that seeks some common ground and is looking for ways to cooperate on global challenges. And I think that's fine. But I think, to me, it is prudent not to overestimate the power of one person in a broad administration and is not uh, prudent at all to think that this trip is going to change some of the long-term strategic trajectories of this relationship. She will have some conversations that, to Michelle's point, it's a little dovish, but that's not going to change what is essentially two economies, two countries that are competing with a lot of structural incongruencies, and one trip isn't going to change all of that, Andrew. Can I add that it's not just Janet Yellen that I'm saying is dovish. Treasury is historically the most dovish arm of the government. It was in the previous administration as well because people in finance are very cognizant of the right. unintended consequences of when sanctions happen, that, that other parts of the administration are less uh, okay, informed Which then about. begs the question, who's got the power in the administration? Oh, I, I, you know, look, overwhelmingly, Washington is hawkish, just like Dwadrick said. Right. Washington is overwhelmingly hawkish on China. They out the, the Republicans and the Democrats are consistently trying to outcompete each other on how hawkish they can sound. You have the China Select Committee that's going to be very hawkish. I think it's going to be very right. difficult for, to push back. I want to go back to Eduardo, but I'm curious, do you, are, are you suggesting that's a mistake or are you suggesting that's the appropriate view at the moment, meaning uh, this, hawkish, this hawkish stance? Go back and read Biden's national security strategy. China is the one country in the world. There are many countries in the world that would like to redo the international order in a more autocratic fashion. China is the only country that can do it militarily and economically. So we have to be very cognizant of that. And as long as Xi Jinping is as vociferous as he is about Taiwan, we have to be very concerned because 90 percent of advanced semiconductors come from Taiwan. We cannot live our lives without them. The Wardrick Amisha, at 60 Minutes the other night, the head of the Navy in that area uh, of the world was asked whether there any, are we doing anything to try and keep Taiwan independent. And he goes, that's the whole reason. That's all I think about when I'm, when I'm there. So we're not just, I mean, we're, we aren't just hoping that they, that they don't or, or wondering whether we can prevent that they do. We're actively trying to make sure that that doesn't happen. And that's not what the Chinese are thinking, is it? The water, it's just a matter of time. 
Well, certainly Xi Jinping has given orders for the PLA to be able to take uh, Taiwan, but having the capability to do so and the willingness are two separate things. But to your point, Joe, U.S. policy is about deterrence so that that decision is never made. And so what you're seeing is a whole host of deterrence measures. So increased presence in the South China Sea, sailing through the Taiwan Straits. All these things are intended to send a signal uh, that prevents Beijing from making decision, even if they may gain the capability to do so on, on Taiwan. Yeah. I mean, the word frenemy was, was made for this relationship. Wasn't that the portmanteau? I mean, the, Tim Cook's over there. Elon's there. Blinken says, yeah, we're, we're you know. We, we are inextricably linked, for sure. At the same time, the business community is already Would you cognizant. preemptively get out? That's a bit of it. Oh, I, I think the, the risk-reward calculation of investing in China and being in China has changed dramatically. It used to be that this was a country that was going to grow a lot, that was reforming a lot. They were doing all kinds of things that were going to lead to more economic growth, and therefore you should be investing there. They're undoing a lot right. of those things. One, and then the risks are extremely high. The rewards are lower, and the risks are you could face sanctions. You could face all kinds of things that um, you didn't anticipate when you first invested in China. But Dwardrick, he's she is not like Putin. I mean, he's there. This is the guy we're going to have. This is going to be the guy we're dealing with, right? There's just no question. There's no Wagner group ready to march on Beijing. I don't see any near-term future without Xi Jinping as the leader of China, Joe. That, that's absolutely correct. This is not a Putin situation in China.